Those whispering guns, oh Christ, I want to go out. And screech at them to stop, I'm going crazy. I'm going stark staring mad because of the guns. This is an extract from the poem, Repression of War by Siegfried Sassoon. The poet experienced the horrors of World War I. He served as an officer and wrote this poem to describe the trauma a young soldier might experience even years after the conflict. No injury better encapsulates this feeling than that of shell shock, a term coined by the soldiers of the First World War. It was a catch-all term for the myriad of conditions brought on by the stresses of the war. It is a visceral description for just what the soldiers faced on a daily basis. In today's video, we will cover what shell shock is, how it was viewed and treated, and how shell shock helped redefine how we view mental illness. Whilst the term shell shock likely started to be used among soldiers during the First World War, it is sometimes called battle fatigue or soldier's heart. The first recorded use of the term shell shock was in the medical publication The Lancet by Charles Samuel Mayers, who treated three soldiers with similar symptoms all attributed to exposure to shell fire or the consequences. For example, one patient had been buried alive for 18 hours following an artillery strike. Some of the first recorded symptoms of shell shock included loss of vision, smell, hearing and loss of memory. Men would experience tremors, being unable to control their bodies, struggling to speak with stammers and prone to panicked violence. As for the physiological symptoms, the soldiers often had feelings of helplessness, fear, panic and anxiety. Samuel Mayers, along with many others at the time, attributed these symptoms to damage to the delicate tissues of the brain and spine, caused by concussive shock from shells landing nearby. As shell shock was initially seen as a physical injury, the soldier was eligible to receive a discharge and a war pension. But as the war progressed, shell shock patients who had not experienced shells exploding nearby began to be recorded. Initially, these soldiers' symptoms were thought to be neurasthenia, a type of nervous breakdown caused by the theatre of war but was still referred to as shell shock. This started the question as to whether there was a physical component to the cause of the illness. It was believed that only certain individuals were susceptible to shell shock, which was sometimes instead referred to as a lack of moral fiber. It was believed that shell shock was a sign of a lack of discipline, a lack of faith in the cause, and as a sign of treacherous behavior. Mutism was seen as a consequence of repressed obstinance to their officer's orders an ironic symptom for those who even thought about talking back. As many of the symptoms were psychological, men were sometimes treated with suspicion as it was thought they were faking the condition to avoid the war. The expectations on both the rank and file soldiers and the officer class were that they were to be stoic, brave and in control of their feelings even in the face of battle. Those suffering from shell shock were therefore seen as cowards, as emasculated and seen as failures. For a time, shell shock was seen as a young soldier's injury. Many of the news articles covering the condition often referred to the patients as scared young boys, ill prepared for the horrors of war. The type of industrial warfare of the First World War was unprecedented. From the poison gas attacks and constant shelling to the dire conditions of trench life, many soldiers left the front broken by their experience. There was a shift in the understanding that the environment was the cause of the shell shock patients and not their moral character. The treatments of shell shock patients were many and changed as the war progressed. When seen as a disciplinary issue, doctors employed berating and beatings. Electric shock therapy was widely used, a key proponent being Dr. Lewis Yeland. Yeland claimed a near 80% success rate with his patients, success being defined as soldiers returning to the front lines. His view on soldiers under his care was that they had experienced a complete loss of manhood and that they ought to remember the bravado that would carry them through the rest of the war. He would employ suggestive therapy and insist the electric shocks would not stop until he saw the improvement he desired. Electric shocks were applied to the affected body parts that were subject to tremors or paralysis. 
For those patients who were mute, the shocks were applied to the throat. Such shocks would continue until the soldiers screamed out, proving the mutism cured. Any fears a soldier may hold were exploited as a means to cure. For example, if a patient feared loud noises, they would be placed in rooms overlooking busy main roads, or those who feared isolation would be placed in solitary confinement. Yet, soon enough, a more compassionate approach developed. One that combined rehabilitative activities with psychotherapy sessions, where the patient would discuss their trauma. The most famous advocates for this was William Hall's Rivers Rivers. And yes, he actually does have Rivers twice in his name. Rivers followed his former student, Charles Samuel Myers, into using his medical experience to assist those injured in the war. Like Myers, Rivers soon became involved in the treatment of shell shock. Rivers sought to employ a cathartic approach, encouraging the patients to understand the basics of psychology and that what they were experiencing was not permanent. Rivers encouraged his patients to open up about the trauma in direct opposition to the stiff upper lip mentality. The key to recovery held to be that only by remembering and understanding why the memories of war that haunted the patient. This approach to the treatment of shell shock soon became the standard of care, with variations as to the approach depending on the individual practitioner. After all, this was a novel identification of an injury that whilst known about, was not properly understood. One of Rivers' notable patients was Siegfried Sassoon, the poet that we quoted at the beginning of the video. Whilst Rivers and doctors like him showed a great deal more compassion for the men under their care than others, there was still the goal to heal their patients so that they might return to military service. In fact, Rivers saw his duty to ensure the men under his care were able to return back to the war, and back to the environment that caused their shell shock. An example as to the types of symptoms a patient might display can be seen in the following actual case. Patient J. Milner of the 14th Reserve Battalion of the Royal Field Artillery, as recorded on the 1st of June 1916. Milner felt the force of an artillery strike that sent him flying into the wheel of a nearby howitzer. He was left dazed and semi-conscious for a short time, and when he tried to call out to his comrades to seek shelter, he found that he could not speak. During his return to Great Britain to obtain medical attention, he developed tremors that grew gradually worse. It reached the point where Milner was bedbound. He lost a lot of weight and his legs wasted to the point where he could no longer stand. On the 23rd of July 1916, Milner was invalided from the war. In 1917, the British command sought to ban the use of the term shell shock. It was believed that the term was far too imprecise. They preferred the term war neurosis to better explain that it was not the impact of the shells that caused the injury but rather the war as a whole. By the end of the war, some 80,000 British soldiers had been diagnosed with shell shock, but it's likely that many more were affected. By the end of the war, 20,000 men were suffering from shell shock. The actual figure in all likelihood is much higher, due to many not receiving a diagnosis but undoubtedly affected. Such was the scale of the problem, many civilian asylums, hospitals, and even spas were used to accommodate the ever-growing number of shell shock patients. It is hard not to look at the expectations put on the men who eagerly signed up to fight in the First World War. Over 2.5 million British men volunteered to fight, initially promised a war that would be over by Christmas, yearning to prove themselves of upholding the ideals of the Victorian gentleman. And yet, the brutality of the horrors and industrialized war was not something that could ever have been imagined. In understanding shell shock, one is confronted with just how fragile the human psyche is, and just how incompatible the pressures put on the young men who enlisted truly was when faced with the reality of war. No longer could it be considered mere cowardice, but instead a very real and very damaging consequence of sending young men into the meat grinder of war. Not only must the generals consider the man and material loss, but also the psychological damage. 
or at least they ought to. Today, PTSD is better understood, and that it applies not only to those who experience the hell that is war. Although the diagnosis has its roots in the muddy, blood-soaked trenches of the First World War, it is widely accepted that anyone can develop PTSD after experiencing or witnessing a traumatic event. But shell shock will remain as a grim reminder of the human cost of war, and the damage that the horrors can have on not only one's body, but also one's mind.